I do to be back on the screens. Welcome to the most watched business show in the country. My name is Michael Abudu, and this is the business meeting show here on CCTV. Follow me on Twitter at MOBD. But yes, it was sponsored by Standard Chapter Branch, Standard Chapter Branch, here for good. Are you ready for one hour business meeting with the team? Definitely with the fun and excitement, and it will be boring in one day. I look like this is the energy sector to some testing. The Ministry of Energy, Ghana National Petroleum Corporation, GNPC, and the Aqua Energy have been in the news of a sound perfect agreement. They are moved to almost double the country's state in the oil company. A sound civil society organization has taken a change in the news, saying it is not true. Our first video on today's show will give you a detailed perspective of both sides of the action. For many, the story of AK Energy in Ghana starts with a $100 million deal to buy Hess Corporation's business in Ghana in 2018 after its initial foray into the oil and gas space in the country in 2008 proved unsuccessful. Peswan to a sales and purchase agreement dated 16 February 2018, Ake acquired all the shares in Hairs Ghana Limited and became the sole owner of Hairs Ghana Exploration Limited. The transaction was approved by the GNPC on 12 April 2018 and by the Minister for Energy on 21 May 2018. Thus, Ake took over the Deepwater Tunnel Petroleum Agreement from Hairs Ghana Exploration Limited and Hairs Ghana Exploration Limited was later renamed Ake Energy Ghana Limited. At the time of the agreement, the Ultra Deep Water Tunnel Cape Three Points block was believed to hold an estimated 550 million barrels of oil equivalent and had the potential for a further 400 million barrels. After some renegotiations at the time, the ownership structure of the block changed, with Ghana's carried participating and commercial interest dropping from over 40% to under 20%, a development which led to serious agitation at the time from different quarters. But three years down the line, the Energy Ministry, on the back of concerns with the global shift from fossil fuels to renewable energy, dwindling investments by oil majors and fossil fuels, as well as a need to ensure that the exploration and production capacity of GNPC is built up for it to be independent in case oil majors pull out of Ghana, submitted a parliamentary memorandum requesting the House to give them, the Energy Ministry, along with the Ministry of Finance, the mandate to agree on a purchase price with Aker Energy and AGM in connection with plans by the GNPC to increase its stake in the two oil and gas companies to 37% and 70% respectively. The parliamentary memorandum also speaks of government providing a loan of about $1.65 billion to GNPC Exploco to facilitate the deals. My colleague Duke Menso Poku is a parliamentary correspondent and he gives us a breakdown of the happenings in parliament with respect to the parliamentary memorandum from the energy ministry. Essentially, the parliamentary memorandum argued that GMPC and GMPC Expo needs to build its operational capacity because of issues with energy transition. They think, in their view, Aker has that capacity. So they partner, there can be some sort of a technology transfer which will then build GMPC Expo operational capacity so that in the future when these global giants are not even coming here to explore, we have our own national oil company, GMPC Expo that has that expertise, that has that operational capacity, that has that know-how to be able to drill oil in commercial quantities, hit commercial quantities, and then continue the production until we run out, uh, uh, we run, we run out of all our oil resources. So that's essentially the, the reason why the Ministry of Energy implored Parliament to approve this and then give them $1.65 billion to buy these shares and this stake so that they'll be able to participate in this joint venture create a joint venture company that is with uh, AGM Ake and GMPC to be able to explore these resources and then in that regard build the operational capacity of um, GMPC Expo to be able to explore these oil resources. Now what Parliament did was to approve a mandate for the Minister of Energy and the Ministers of Finance to go onto the negotiating table and, and negotiate terms of this joint partnership and this acquisition of stake 37% in the um, deep, deep water cave three points and then 70 percent in, um, in the deep tunnel uh, water oil blocks these oil blocks so that's what they did and it is 
expressed in the committee's report that they will come back and report to Parliament on whatever I mean, conclusions they reach on these negotiations. So the loan that they, were, that they are seeking, 1.65 billion, where 1.3 will go into the acquisition of the, of, of, of the states, and then 350 million will go into um, our interest in, in, in exploring the Peckham fields and all of that. That has not been approved by Parliament. Civil society organizations in the country have been up in arms over the request of the Energy Ministry calling into question the value assigned to the oil fields in question as well as the cost incurred on the blocks so far, among other issues. Duncan Amwa is the Executive Secretary of the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, COPEC, a member of the Alliance of CSOs working on extractives, anti-corruption and good governance, and he explains the grievances of the CSOs and the way forward. The CSO platform is essentially not against AMTC becoming an oil operator. We are only asking at what cost or at what investment option. The agreement in the form and manner we have seen doesn't give hope and confidence that Ghana could get value for money. We say this on the back of the fact that the AGM wells are not agreed to determine how much oil is in there. And yet DMPC is going ahead to negotiate for 70% in AGM world. That is not only risky, but it's quite a careless kind of investment to make at this time when the West is looking to ban fossil fuels, particularly diesel. And so we are saying that whatever investment that we are putting in, it should be adequately informed, it should be value for money back, whatever that we need to do as a country to ensure that our negotiations come out, I mean, Ghanaians expected. We should do it. This is 1.1 billion, 1.6 billion at everything and not becoming an operator for some of us is a lot more risky than possibly going out there to do your own exploration and uh, determining what to do with the oil under the ground. We turn our attention now to the formation of the board of the various government agencies. It has been literally eight months since the government took office. But at least we are seeing some progress. Last week was the road fund for it, and this week some more have been completed, like the security to end up with the set. You know how important the government's hundred billion dollars in the Ghana share of my central program is to the financial sector. Mr. Yaka, particularly as the government is working to revive the economy in the impact of the COVID 19 pandemic. So, he is urging the new set board to regularly and streamline the development of the capital market to make it more effective and efficient for the development of the community. The Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, is the apex regulatory body of the securities industry in Ghana, set up by the Securities Industry Act 2016, Act 929, to regulate and promote the growth and development of an efficient, fair and transparent securities market in which investors and the integrity of the market are protected. As part of efforts to enable the Commission achieve its objective, Finance Minister Kenuforiata on Tuesday 10th August 2021 inaugurated an 11-member board to maintain surveillance of activities and securities. Speaking at a ceremony to inaugurate the boards of the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Ghana Revenue Authority and the Social Security and National Insurance Trust SNIT, Finance Minister Kenufuriata charged the newly constituted 11-member board of the SEC to regulate and streamline the development of the capital market to make it more effective and efficient for the development of the Ghanaian economy. How to reconstitute our long-term funds is going to be crucial to our development. Uh, and so your role in facilitating, promoting this is, is key to Ghana's um, um, transformation. Um, the year has not been that bad. I think you've, um, the stock exchange uh, has done reasonably well. Is it over 26 percent or something? It's 41 percent. Wow. Um, so yes, yeah, so 41 percent uh, index, and believe it or not, that's 40 percent in dollar terms. So. Um, for those who took the risk, I think we are doing very well indeed. Um, and it's the best performance on the continent and one of the best in the world um, this year. Um, so 
thanks for that. Um, it was also interesting last year where remittances globally were down by about 25%. Ghana actually inched up in that period. Um, so we are seeing um, a certain response to this uh, COVID experience, which is um, counter-cyclical in a sense um, to what the world is experiencing. And I guess that goes to um, augment the issue of our image, what we are doing right, and the direction that we want to go. Um, so your role is, is even more pronounced uh, in this, um, to keep uh, a sense um, to the investment world um, that this is a destination, you know, worth um, looking at. Can Oforiata also charged the newly integrated board of the Ghana Revenue Authority to initiate aggressive measures and efficient revenue tax administration. Consequently, the GRA has been taxed to collect a total revenue of 57.06 billion for the 2021 fiscal year, representing a 25.7% growth over the 45.4 billion collected for the 2020 uh, fiscal year. For many years now, the Ghana Cocoa Board, Cocoa Board, has fulfilled its mission of encouraging and facilitating the production, processing and marketing of good quality cocoa, coffee and share nuts in all forms in the most efficient and cost-effective manner. Over the years, several boards of directors appointed by government governs the Ghana Cocoa Board. They are usually composed of government nominees from various professions, a representative of the workers of Cocoa Board, and two representatives of the Cocoa, Coffee and Share Nut Farmers Association. As part of efforts to enable the board to achieve its objective of improving the country's standing in the cocoa value chain, the Minister for Food and Agriculture, Dr. Ousue Friya Koto, swore in an 11-member board to oversee activities in the sector. Speaking at the ceremony, Dr. Friya Koto taxed the board to ensure efficient financing of cocoa production to avoid saddling farmers with debts. We know the problems facing the marketing cocoa in this country, the role of foreign buyers, the very weak position of local uh, LBCs in the purchase of cocoa and all that. Uh, these are challenges we need to be tackled um, just as much as on the production side. We need to look at how we are going to make sure that the financing of the bigger crop is done without uh, impeding on the finances of the farmers because as you know we've had quite a lot of complaints from farmers about delayed payments. The new chairman of the board Peter McMainu pledged his commitment to ensuring the smooth running of the sector to bring value to all actors in the industry. We will work to consolidate the gains made strengthen and accelerate the implementation of ongoing policies, many of them that the minister has just now uh, uh, told us, projects and programs and initiatives to achieve to achieve sustained improvement in yield to ensure sustainable incomes for our illustrious cocoa farmers. Honorable Minister, we will work hand in hand with management, staff, licensed buyers, and all stakeholders to bring value to all actors within the cocoa value chain.
Members of the board include the chairman, Peter McMainu, the CEO of Cocoa Board, Joseph Boahin Edu, Governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Ernest Addison, Minister of State at the Finance Ministry, Charles Edu Boahin, a Deputy Minister for Food and Agriculture, Dr. Yao Frimpong Adu, and Herbert Krapa, who is a Deputy Minister for Trade and Industry. Others are Nana Obeya Kofi, Nana Johnson Mensa, who are farmers, businesswoman Nanajwa Dokuya, Edward Oko Ampofo, the Cocoa Board Rep on the Board, and the Member of Parliament for Suhum Kwejo Asante. This will bring an end to the practice where some of these folks have just the food to the detriment of the farmers in the country. When the second time they come to the new economy, I'll just explain to you how to do it. Ghana is one of the leaders in cocoa production, but farmers who grow the crop face some challenges in their daily work. Apart from challenges with pricing of the beans on the international markets, which directly affects the farmer, they have also been victims of the practice of skill adjustments. Checks by the Ghana Cocoa Board, Cocoa Board, together with the Ghana Standards Authority, revealed that some licensed buying companies and purchasing clerks tamper with their weighing skills. This practice leaves farmers at a disadvantage as they end up with less than what the cocoa beans are worth. On the back of this, Cocoa Board is set to introduce a digital skill for the weighing of cocoa beans. With this initiative, all cocoa farmers in the country will be registered and issued with cards that will enable them to sell their cocoa beans in the country and earn the true worth of their produce. In an interview with City Business News, the head of public affairs at Cocoa Board, Fifi Boafo, said the move would bring finality to the practice. The decision to introduce the electronic skill was to deal with a problem we had identified whereby license buying agents were actually tempering with the skills they were using and by tempering with the skills they were putting the farmers at a disadvantaged position so in fact the chief executive went around the country whistle stops across some of the uh, stations we realized that they had tempered with the skills so we actually commissioned the uh, Standards Authority to do a nationwide uh, work to assess really whether or not the skills they were using are the rightful ones or they've been tempered with. And the report shows that largely all the agents had tempered with the skills they were using. Beginning the new cocoa season, which starts in October, uh, all licensed buying companies will be compelled or will be obliged to use this uh, non uh, this skills, the electronic skills, which you do not have the opportunity to temper with. He added that the move was necessary as the punishments meted out to perpetrators were not harsh enough to deter them from the practice. If you look at the law about uh, weighing and skills uh, by the standards authority, there is a, a punishment uh, regime which they have. And indeed, in the, those instances whereby we've had uh, People, they caught them, if you like, uh, cheating farmers. Uh, Standards Authority have applied the sanctions. But they were of the view that the, the sanctions or the punishment was not punitive enough. So some felt emboldened to continue with that practice. So we had to take a, a step further, which will rather stop the act from even taking place uh, before you even talk about going to apply sanctions or something like that. So definitely, this is coming to curb the act of cheating farmers at the point of sale of the Akoku. Aside from the challenge of bird flu, which has ravaged the poultry industry one more time, the industry continues to battle with the high cost of inputs. At some point, the farmers said they were not able to get feed to buy for their birds because they were just unavailable. In the past few 
months, we've seen increases in feed costs. Not only have we seen these increases, we've also seen shortages. Um, I had to try to become a deal finder for uh, the producer of my feed, kosher, because I need them to supply me with the feed. And they don't have me, so I'm looking for someone that can supply them. And then we are talking about, like you rightfully said, the measures you have to put in place to tighten your biosecurity on the farm. So it's, it's not an easy season for us. In a bid to ensure the availability of soya beans for the production of poultry feed, the ministries of Agri and Trade and Industry have announced the decision to regulate the export of soya beans, which serve as a source of protein for poultry. The Greater Accra Poultry Farmers Association lauds the move and praised the government to look at the regulation of maize and other grains used in the poultry industry. We are very glad uh, to hear uh, what um, has been inaugurated in terms of the committee that will oversee the export or exportation of um, the soya. Uh, it's an indication that uh, our, our requests and our supplications have been ahead. Uh, because um, once we don't, we don't have the beans, then what is going to happen that the poultry farmers or the animal uh, farmers will not have what they need uh, to work with. So it's, it's, it's a sign in the right direction. We will only ask that um, similar interventions should be made for maize and then wheat bran uh, so that it will be a complete uh, 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 or a holistic process. As a, as, as a protein source, and uh, um, if, if you don't want to use fish, then that's, that's the other alternative that you have to use. So, and fish is actually expensive and unavailable. And prices of maize and other commodities are already high. So if you go for the other alternative, then what, what it means is that the, the price that you are crying, you are actually going to exceed. And we are trying to manage the price and bring down costs. So we are using the alternative, the plant source, uh, that, which is more... Uh, uh, which is much a bit cheaper, not much cheaper, but uh, cheaper than the fish sauce. Uh, so um, that's what we are using. And the alternatives are not too many, and and this this is our best bet. Other installations in the factory include modern pipe boiling, milling and packaging machinery, a standby power plant and a mechanized borehole for frequent water supply. The state-of-the-art Savalugu rice processing factory is expected to produce between 1.5 to 2.8 tons of rice within an hour. The president paid a courtesy call on the Yona and Danny Yakubu Abdullah the fourth as part of his two-day working tour of the northern region on Saturday. The Yona Abdullah Yakubu and Danny the fourth in his speech said the importance of the rice processing factory in the socio-economic growth of the Savalugo municipality could not be underestimated. He noted it will add value to the production of rice, increase income of farmers, and create jobs for the teeming unemployed youth. The rice processing factory has not been underestimated. As it will add value to the production of rice, increase income of rice farmers, and create employment for the people in the area. We appreciate the numerous programs and environmental projects in the area of education, health, President Nana Ado also thanked the chief and his subject for the immense support during the 2020 general election. He further expressed his gratitude. 
to the overlord of Dagbon, Yana Muhammad Abu Bakr the second, Yona Abdullah Yaqub and Dani the fourth, and Menglana Abdullah Muhammadu the third, for the landmark achievement that brought reconciliation, peace, and unity to the Dagbon Kingdom. He assured that Sabulugo will be home to one of the Agenda 111 government hospitals earmarked to vigorously uplift the infrastructure needs in the health of the country. Today, I'm here before you, the three people who are responsible for this historic achievement of peace, reconciliation, and unity. After months of researching on their project topics, the students of the Catering and Hospitality Department of the Tamale Technical University brought their skills to bear. They used local ingredients to produce competitive products as part of their project works. But some of the students, like Usman Garibanajat and Atidu Joyce, complain of bottlenecks in the system that threatens to hinder the entrepreneurial drive. Um, the challenges we face in producing our products and registering it, the cost is very high and um, currently in Ghana it's who you know. So until you, you, you know someone, you can't be able to register your products and make it successful. It's, it's, it's a big day thing that uh, is good for we the youth like us because in this I don't need any government to employ me. I can employ myself and even employ the youth around me and teach them more things to do with it, which they wouldn't have even looked for anybody for employment. The Food and Drugs Authority, FDA in the northern region, however, allayed the fears of the students. Ibrahim Hafiz is a regulatory officer at the FDA in Tamale. For, for that, it's a fallacy because. F come, registering with FDA is the simplest thing you can do. Just that when you don't come to the office or when you don't interact with FDA, you will think the registration is very difficult. There are three key things you need to do. Of course, before you register a product in Ghana, before you do any business in Ghana, you should have a business certificate. So when you acquire the business certificate, then you come to FDA, who just ask you to pay something small. After payment, you do analysis of your product because it's food. So we have to know the composition of the of that particular food product you are coming to register. You said you are coming to register, so you have to prove to us that the product is okay when it comes to scientific analysis. Then after that, you do medicals for your workers because you are a food handler. So you are serving a number of people, millions of people. So you have to do food handler's test. You have to do for diseases that are communicable. We can talk of typhoid, we can talk of tuberculosis, we can talk of hepatitis A. So if your workers or if yourself you don't have those diseases, then that is okay. We come to your facility, carry out inspection. After inspection, we pick samples from your facility, send to Accra. You'll be given a number after the review. So what makes it difficult? The theme for the exhibition was Eat Ghana, Wear Ghana, and See Ghana in the midst of COVID-19, the role of technical university students. The head of the Department of the Hospitality and Tourism Department, Al Hassan Fatao is confident given the needed support, his students will be job creators instead of job seekers. Apart from just doing the right thing, like what we call the theory project that a lot of other institutions do, we have sidelined that. And we say that when the writing is important, the student might know. But after having written the work, what do you do with it? Then we say that write them because you need to know the research processes. And at the same time, produce something. When you produce, then our emphasis is now to be able to coach you to the extent that you are able to go out there and produce. 
The students of the Tamale Technical University they have put their creativity into use. They produce a variety of household products. However, and many of them fears their creativity may just end up in the shelves, just like the conventional project work staff. The Sunyani Technical University's quest to ensure her students have the needed employable skills has led to the establishment of an entrepreneurship hub and business ideas incubation center. The center is to train students in entrepreneurship and also help them develop their business ideas before they leave the institution. The center is furnished with computers and internet access to facilitate research among others. Basically, the establishment of this hub, we thought it wise to uh, create an avenue for students uh, to get an idea about uh, entrepreneurship so that uh, when they go out, they will not depend on the uh, government or government jobs, but they can uh, establish themselves. Yeah, that is the idea. And then uh, we decided to have this up in order for them to get the necessary knowledge that will enable them to carve their own way when after, after school. We are not doing it alone, and uh, we are collaborating with the NEIP, EA, and other agencies so that uh, we can have a sustainable program for our students because uh, the NEIP, the e, uh, GEA and others are established government agency and they will be their perpetuality. And for that matter, we are linking to them so that uh, we can have the necessary uh, materials or logistics and then the funding also to support our students. The Entrepreneurship Hub is also partnering with the National Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program, NEP. So this is an incubation hub and we are going to direct this institution on the processes of incubating new ideas for these young people and help them to be able to transform their learning into right uh, business models. So we are going to provide the technical support for them. We are going to provide training, also support for this uh, center, and also provide some form of funding for the idea that will come through this center. Some of the students have been sharing their thoughts on the establishment of the business hub. Okay, to me as a student, I think bringing up this entrepreneurship help will help me learn and get new ideas about being an entrepreneur because I have an objective of after here, I want to have my own business. I want to have a business on my own that I will manage. And so I think with this, I can learn new things from the help, then it will help me when I'm establishing my own business. It will help a lot because since we do not always have those opportunities like this or an avenue like this, we do find it difficult when we are about to do research and other activities. Maybe I'm embarking on my project as a student where to get the opportunities to do research and other activities to help me get the refined information or necessary information to support my project. The 
The Credit Reporting System, CRS, is a database established under Act 726 to promote the sharing of information on the credit history of debtors with lenders and other users of the credit reporting system. This is generally to ensure that, amongst other things, persons with bad credit histories, like non-payment of loans, are found out and prevented from getting credits from other institutions. Years after the passage of the Credit Reporting Act 2007, the Bank of Ghana in Peswan to the Credit Reporting Regulations 2020, LI-230, has expanded the list of institutions required to participate in a credit reporting system to include the likes of telecommunications companies, utility companies, retailers, mobile money operators, fintechs, student loan schemes provided by private or government agencies, among others. Speaking to City Business News, following the expansion of the list, banking consultant Nanutui Champon said the move is likely to impact the pricing of credit for borrowers across the country. It has an impact on uh, the pricing of credit because pricing of credit is primarily looking at the risk complexion of the borrower. And so the better the risk, the, the better the price that will be put on that credit. So this is, uh, in a way, going to help, as I said, both the borrowers and the lenders, because the borrowers having good credit will be able to access cheaper loans, and those with bad credit will access um, more expensive loans, and therefore everybody will aim to be uh, a good credit risk so that they can access cheaper loans. Nano to further charge the regulator and lenders to ensure records are accurate and up to date to prevent any unfair assessment of borrowers. It's a good start, um, but the problem that we may have here is the accuracy of the records that we have. Over there, it's gone on for so long that uh, even still, you do get instances where people's records are not properly kept, and then they challenge the agency as to why did you put this on my record when maybe I've paid my loan. Uh, we have instances in this country where even with the banks and deposit-taking institutions, you borrow, you pay, and two or three years later, they still have record that you owe them, you know, and so it will go against your credit. So if we are coming down to institutions like telcos and so on, whose records may not be as uh, sparkling clean, clean as we have with the banks, then we are in for a challenge. And so we have to ensure that they keep good records and rate people accordingly and, um, and not disadvantage them. <laughs> The Bank of Ghana defines a measure as the fusion or amalgamation of two or more regulated financial institutions and an acquisition as the purchase or takeover by an inquirer of a regulated financial institution which gives the acquirer control in that institution. The advent of the banking sector cleanup and the need for institutions to shore up their minimum capital requirement witnessed some measures and acquisitions in the universal banking space. One of such examples is the consolidated Bank Ghana, which was formed out of the measure of Beige Bank, Sovereign Bank, Construction Bank, Royal Bank, and Unibank. The Bank of Ghana's New Measures and Acquisitions Directive provides that the central bank can annul any such takeover or acquisition of a regulated financial institution in the country if its stipulated rules are contravened. According to the central bank, a proposed transaction that has had the effect to substantially lessen competition shall not be approved unless it finds that the anti-competitive effects of the proposed transaction are clearly outweighed in the public interest by the probable effects of the transaction in meeting the convenience and needs of the community to be served. The central bank pointed out that there would be a three-stage approach to the application procedure with two inherent approval stages of an application for a measure or acquisition by a bank or SDI. Should institutions fail to follow these directives, the Bank of Ghana may by order annul the transfer measure amalgamation or reconstruction prohibits the exercise of voting rights in respect of the shares, prohibits the payment of dividends
dividends in respect of the shares or prohibit the issue of bonus shares or rights issue in respect of the shares. In addition to any penalty provided under the Anti-Money Laundering Act 2008 Act 749, a person who contravenes a directive will be liable to pay to the Bank of Ghana an administrative penalty of not less than 2,000 penalty units and not more than 10,000 penalty units. The Bank of Ghana has signed an agreement with Gisek Devriant, GND, to implement a pilot central bank digital currency in Ghana as a precursor to the issuance of a digital form of the national currency, the CD. The project is part of the Digital Ghana Agenda, which involves the digitization of the country and its government services. The digital CD or ECD is intended to complement and serve as a digital alternative to physical cash, thus driving the Ghanaian cash light agenda through promotion of diverse digital payments while ensuring a secure and robust payments infrastructure in Ghana. It also aims to facilitate payments without a bank account, contracts or smartphone, by so doing boosting the use of digital services and financial inclusion among all demographic groups. We have really come a long way as a country when it comes to digital transactions. These days, almost everybody has a normal account. The convenience of the is just immeasurable. Spending and receiving money from wherever, being able to take a good and service of life from the comfort of your home, is just marvelous. These days, I don't forget to tell you. But imagine this. Having money in two wallets and with these channels, of course, the service provider and your sex tax. I'm sure we have all at some point explained this one way or the other. It's clearly said that we still have a long way to go when it comes to becoming fully cashless society. Over the past decade, mobile money accounts have increased 30-fold, recording about 44 million Ghana cities as of June 2021. The volume of mobile money interoperability transactions has also increased 24-fold since its launch in 2018, resulting in 10.3 million Ghana cities as of June 2021, according to the Bank of Ghana. Despite all these, cash payments remain the most preferred mode for many businesses. The governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Ernest Addison, in a speech read on his behalf at a Momo stakeholder engagement, said the situation left more to be desired. Currently, financial technology companies, fintechs, are collaborating with traditional financial institutions to provide innovative financial service solutions such as digital savings, credit, pension, and insurance. Indeed, financial digitization has expanded to include products that support government revenue collections, utility payments, and disbursement of financial aid to vulnerable groups in society. Banks and other financial institutions have all intensified efforts to move operations to digital platforms to better serve customers. With such giant strides in Ghana financial digitization process, one would have thought that cash usage will go down to the barest minimum. Unfortunately, this is not so, despite the attendant risk with cash usage. This clearly shows that the adoption of digital payments still remains uneven, and there is room for improvement to move the frontier towards financial inclusiveness through broad-based digital payments. To take advantage of the existing opportunities, the bank long-term strategy for the payment system is to push for more collaboration among providers of financial digital products and electronic financial services. Head of FinTech at the Bank of Ghana, Kwame Opong, stated that the Bank of Ghana is working at enhancing the adoption of digital payments for goods and services. As a country, the bulk of our digitization efforts have to be focused on merchant payments. This is why we're taking the painstaking 
effort to ensure that we're working with everyone on GHQR. The cash sits mostly between people paying businesses. This is where the volume sits. Look in your own lives. On a monthly basis, how many people are you sending money to versus how many times are you making a payment? If we really want to uproot cash or at least reduce it to the barest minimum, we absolutely have to look at merchant payment. And we have to be able to do that collaboratively as an industry and not single-handedly. No single service provider can achieve this objective without collaborating with others. Speaking at the same event, CEO of MTN Mobile Money and Convener of the Stakeholder Engagement Forum, Elihini, called for enhanced collaboration among industry players. We need to find ways to uh, collaborate more. For me, that's it. One person can't do it all. And it can't be one person's responsibility. It's a responsibility for all the players within the ecosystem. And I think where we need to um, go is to find the synergy to support one another and achieve the same focus. And I mentioned the same word again, another C word. Let's take away the conversation around competition and let's look at complementing each other's effort and collaborating better. I think those, for me, will be the key words I'll leave here. Mm. And of course, in, in all this is the customer. In all this conversation is the customer. Now let's talk about tax rates and lens. Did you know that the hotel in Ghana County paid over 13 of them, including regulatory fees? With all of these financial obligations, how are they expected to thrive, especially amid this pandemic? This is part of the reasons why the Ghana Hotel Association is calling on the government to review the taxes, levies, and the regulatory fees of travel in Africa so they can realize their employment potential. Despite its huge potential for job creation due to its labor-intensive nature, the hospitality and tourism sector will continue to underemploy due to the high cost of operation. And this is the concern of President of the Ghana Hotels Association, Dr. Edward Akanyameke. According to him, the sector is capable of creating jobs for more than 500,000 people, both direct and indirectly, even though it is currently doing far less than desirable. Dr. Edward Akanyameke told City Business News, government review of the taxes and levies they are often slapped with could make a difference. Uh, the, there are various components when it comes to costing our services. We can talk about taxes, we can talk about levies, we can talk about utilities, we can talk about remuneration, and even the cost of maintenance, and of course the cost of the materials and equipment that we use. And when you put all of these together, the cost is so, so high. And once the cost is high, the, it's the consumer that pays for it. Now, this also affects the ability of the hotels to expand their operations. And the expansion also involves uh, employing more hands to, to, to help. And that has been one of the challenges facing the industry in terms of employment. So if you go to the books of a lot of the hotels, you don't really see much growth in the number of employees per se, because expansion is usually a big challenge and uh, it goes back to the cost of operations. Okay, so if we could have special dispensation for say the value of the tax, that could bring the cost down and maybe more acceptable by the customer, yeah. You know, it's quite easier for the government to raise revenue by imposing taxes on goods and services as compared to taxes like income tax and property tax where the individual or organization has to make an effort to pay. So taxes on goods and services, you might as well be paying for them without even realizing as a part of the cost of the item. The challenge with this approach is that the poor suffer the most because they would end up paying so much the little they have. Tax experts think that the government ought to focus on the other options in order to balance the issue. For every country, 
There are two basic modes of taxation. The most common approach is in the form of indirect taxes or consumption taxes. These taxes are charged on regular consumables paid for by any consumer without any recourse to their levels of income. Alternatively, there are direct taxes that are charged directly on people's earnings. Owing to the ease of its application, indirect taxes have become the most preferred. But tax consultant Dr. Abdullah Ali Nachia says the government has to ensure a balance in the drive for government revenue inflows and the cost of living of a regular Ghanaian. Because a lot of the items involved may be elastic in demand, it will surely affect government revenue. But I was of the view that if we need to make sure we are balancing the revenue inflows with the cost of living of the lower income earners and middle income earners in society, then we need to look at the basic areas of consumption of goods and services and be moderate in the taxes that are imposed on those goods and services which is why there has been the call whether we should take a second look at the straight VAT levies. Straight levies, I call VAT levies because they used to be part of the VAT charge. That is the get fund levy of 2.5% and the national health insurance levy of 2.5%, which are now straight levies because you cannot recover them as part of your input tax. Formerly, you could. And where you are able to recover them as part of your input tax, it means you can't pass it on to price because you are only an agent collecting for government and reimbursing yourself when you charge a VAT. Tax expert Francis Timor Boy advocates a focus on direct taxes, which he says are more considerate of the poor and underprivileged. You see, the good thing about income tax is that it is mostly progressive. So the richer person pays the higher portion. If you are rich, you pay the more. It is progressive. The higher you earn, the higher you pay. Take, for example, PAY. If somebody earns 240,000 Ghana cities a year, the person pays a tax, a marginal rate at the highest, which is 30%. The problem with the indirect tax is that the poor and the rich they, there's no different. They, there's no distinction. The poor man is paying COVID levy. The rich man is paying COVID levy. That is the only problem we have. We're saying that yes, we have a lot of people within the economy who are poor. So if you are doing more of indirect taxes, those poor people are suffering the more. And that is why we expect that there should be some progressive attempts to tax the income of. Ghanaians, so that we may limit the level of indirect taxes. Um, for example, you buy beer and then you can pay as high as 47.5% in excise duty. We're saying that these are high. Look at communication service tax. Look at, I mean, it, it, a lot, a lot of indirect taxes uh, are, are available in Ghana, and we think that the, it, it may affect the poor the most. The famous flying salary structure was introduced 11 years ago to standardize salaries of government employees. The famous flying salary structure was introduced 11 years ago to standardize salaries of government workers. This has not got a lot of public support when it was introduced because it basically left out the playing field. Those who used to earn too little got a good rate. But now, the trade union Congress says it's time to move with the policies here as well. The single spine salary structure was implemented some 11 years ago. At the time, it was rolled out to regulate the payments of public sector workers. The policy replaced the Ghana universal salary structure, which was fraught with some salary discrepancies. Despite the well-crafted nature and the objective of the policy, its implementation has not been without some obstacles. Public sector workers have, over the years, complained of poor conditions of services under the policy. Another concern is government's financial commitments to the Ghanaian worker. 
These have contributed to a lot of labor agitations in recent times and has even become more critical due to agitations that arose from the recent increase of public sector salaries by 4%. In an interview with City Business News on the sidelines of a post-mid-year budget seminar organized by the TUC and Frederick Ebers Tiftang, the Secretary General of the Trade Union Congress, Yaoba, outlined what they are doing to see to the review of the single spine salary structure. There are various elements of single spine that may still be relevant. Uh, but if we look at it holistically, we may have to adjust here and there to make sure that it reflects you know, uh, the current uh, standards and the situation we are in in this country today. Because as, as our analysis showed, real wage for public sector workers has started declining, and it is not right. We should make sure that the single spine is designed to ensure that real wages actually increase. We have organized labor in the public service. Uh, that brings together all the unions that operate in the public service, especially all those that have their members on the single spine. Uh, we are already working together. So on the issue of single spine, all what we need is to give a special focus because of the backlash we got after the conclusion of the public service negotiation this year. And I'm sure we are capable of working together to ensure that there is a review that favors our members in the public service. Thank you.